Hello and welcome to the beginner's guide of the SAWS connector. My name is Paul, I'm your host for today and in this video I'm going to show you everything you need to get started with any connector. First, we are going to set up the environment. Then we are going to have a look at the auto-installed contents of entities, the SAWS tables, then the connector suite and in the end we will configure an entire export in the new dynamic JSON connector. As always, this video supports YouTube chapters, allowing you to jump to any point of interest. Considering the length of this video, my recommendation is to bookmark it, to be able to return to it later and then use the chapters to pick it up where you left off. So let's get started. The setup of the environment. So if you're on the contents of cloud or um, you have a local installation where you use subversion to install the connectors or you used our installer right here, um, it doesn't matter, you will have these folders in your model use directory in your contents of installation. Um, you will always have this folder right here, the SAWS connector. That's what we call the base connector because it contains the code which is shared throughout every connector. For example, the GUI for the most part. And then you will have um, connector specific modules for the other connectors. Um, like in this case, the generic XML connector. And um, it doesn't matter on which content serve installation you are, you will always have these. In rare occasions, some connectors are dependent on another. For example, the TYPO3 connector uses the JSON connector. Um, so if you're doing a custom installation yourself, you must consider that. But um, for the installer or the contents of cloud, it will be considered for you. And then let's hop right here. So as you can see in the navigator, there are several connectors. Um, I do not even have every connector installed right now, um, but uh, it is safe to say that um, any target system you can think of can be supported with one of these connectors, especially the um, connectors names named generic or dynamic um, means these connectors build completely free structures which can then be sent to um, a target system. For example, if your system is XML based, you can then connect to it via the XML connector by building a specific structure that is needed for um, the target system. And uh, well, to, su to sum it up, um, any system can be connected to with the connector, some better, some worse, but um, one way or the other. And another thing I wanted to uh, clear up, you once you get into the connector suite, I will show you how to um, add this to your content serve GUI. Um, you will also see this uh, version summary here. And right now I'm on the uh, beta, which means the version that is still developed on. And you will probably be on a stable. And uh, if we talk about an update, for example, we often um, send out newsletters if a new update is available. And uh, for example, we call an update the 1.16.1, which means there is a new stability version, the 0.1 at the end, for the 1.16. And if I say, um, if we say the 1.16.1, we um, always mean the base connector, but of course you should update the others can other connectors then as well. But it can often happen that um, no stability update is necessary for a specific connector. For example, uh, we fixed something in the generic XML connector, but uh, shopware doesn't need an update. Um, so then shopware will still stay at the 1.16.0. And well, the generic XML connector will be the 1.16.1. Um, so the newest stable version. And as always, if you um, install a new connector version, especially when installing a new feature version, um, you should update the data model. The installer does that for you and also the contents of cloud. But if you install it locally yourself, you should head into the installation, uh, into update data model expand that without clicking here and then just click once on complete update. You can also just update the um, 
base and the connector, but uh, I always click on complete update because it's never too wrong to have a um, up-to-date data model. So um, the first thing you should be doing when your connector is freshly installed, uh, that's also shown in the installer video, is to give your user or the users you would like to uh, control the connector the um, according rights. Because So let's head into the roles. In my case, I'm the administrator on this condenser system and then head down here to the base connector and uh, to the connector rights. Uh, we have connector rights for almost everything uh, concerning the connector, which means you can really control who sees, um, which roles see what things. Um, and you can also make roles that only um, that can only see the configurations, but not edit them. We especially um, made a case for that, but um, if you see through the rights, there's one um, particularly special right right here. Ignore chop and station rights. Always sh show all. This means that um, the station and chop specific rights, um, we will come to these, um, are then ignored because you can also limit a station, so um, one of these export configurations, to a single user. But we'll get to this later. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of special rights if you want to um, hide some of the connector components, also if you maybe think they are not necessary. So, um, but even with the rights active, you won't be able to see the connector at first. So I will show you how to edit. We are right now at the uh, new GUI of Condenserve. So um, let's show you right here what I mean by that. Uh, right here, there's uh, the type of navigation. I'm right now on the new one. I will show you both of these. Um, to add the connector suite, like I did here, to the new um, to the new uh, navigation, you will have to unlock your navigation right here, and then add an app. You, for the, for an app icon, there is even a an icon called SAWS, um, and then say, yeah, uh, that's my connector, all right, and it's visible for everyone or just for me. And then you must select Studio Widget, if I remember correctly. And there, there should be the SAWS connector. Once you add that, you have the suite like I do right here. Um, I will just skip that and un and lock it again. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, and it's still right here. Very well, okay. And uh, now let's switch to the old navigation because it's a bit more complex there. Um, the old navigation is even much more customizable. Okay, and let's see here. We have to refresh and load the entire navigation anew. Oh, and it's uh, purple. <laughs> and as you may know, um, in the old navigation, you can add components up here in the bottom bar. And it, I added my suite right there. Or you can... Um, build a navigation like this where a lot of components are here and you can also add the connector of course as to the sidebar here the suite to do so you must once again unlock the portal um, let's say you want to add it to the sidebar here then you must hover here and see this uh, this button the the cogwheel and then on the key icon you can then add the connector to your studio applications. And for the other bar, you already see the plus here to add a tab. So you must add a studio, if I remember correctly. Let's see here, create new SAWS tutorial. That only has one column. Let's see here. And then we want to add a studio. So dashboard widget portal studio, because um, our connector suite is a studio as well. Then we say this studio right here is the SAWS connector. 
very well. Okay, so uh, even a, a bit tough to me for me to find. <laughs> um, but here we are. So here we are in, in the new navigation again. And um, now let's also have a look at the connector settings. So um, the connector links um, itself into a lot of content surf uh, of the normal content surf configurations um, via the plugin APIs. So uh, for the settings as well, there is now the uh, connector section. Uh, the dependency manager is updated automatically. Let's look into the general settings. There's the license. Well, I won't be able to show you that. <laughs> and uh, then the server URLs here you can um, set an alternate URL. These uh, normally just leave these fields empty. In my case, um, for my development, I have them set to the appearance. And name of the tab in the CS editor for stations with CS, we always mean content surf in a, an abbreviation. And uh, this means that for the connectors who create uh, special attributes in your product editor, um, and then this defines where these special attributes will be uh, can be found in the product editor. Then to the global settings. Yeah, let's start with the attribute of the product SKU. With the SKU, we mean um, the normal product number or GTIN. Um, there are a lot of abbreviations for the product number. Um, we just went for that. Uh, the the SKU uh, just select the attribute here that is used for your product number. This is uh, useful in a lot of different connector implementations, and uh, but not this does not really um, concern the exports in any way. But uh, is very useful for the GUI. Then um, delete log entries older than n days. This just means that um, to um, clean your database, um, how long the logs should persist. Often it is changed to 90 days, for example. But of course, then the database will be more bloated with logs. That's um, clear. So I will leave it at 30 in my case. Um, max minimum count of log entries. Um, with this options, option, not every uh, lock entry is um, meant with that. Uh, it means how many job runs are kept um, from what I know. So um, just a short X course here. Um, when ex when performing an export, there is always a uh, lock header created right here. And this lock has the lock entries. And from what I know, this means that um, these job logs, so, um, these log folders created per job run, uh, that only 1,000 of them are kept. 1,000 are um, well enough at first, but if you have a lot of exports, maybe you want to raise that number. So we added the option. Interval for the station checks. This just means that um, the stations, they will check themselves for um, invalid configurations and uh, they can be found right here. And this just means how often these checks are performed. In my case, I will always check this tab anyway, so um, I can have the interval very high. Extend, extended event handling for CS objects. Um, this option can be just uh, set like this and directory of the SAWS connector backup. Um, this means if you create local backups of your configurations, well, um, one must say that uh, the connector is able to create, you can create backups of any configuration in the connector. These are not the normal content surf backups, which um, will just make a backup of your database. No, they are um, really a, a JSON backup of uh, your configuration itself. This means that the configuration can be inserted everywhere else uh, in 
in any other condenser system or any other connector, so, uh, any other station I meant by that. Uh, and for the backups, we have our OWL cloud. So you can upload your backup into our cloud here in Munich and then download it wherever you want. But if you want to store a backup locally, we often call it the local cloud, um, it is stored in the MAM, the Media Asset Management, and you can control where um, these backups are saved. If you do not set something here, it will be stored in this folder, so context as AWS connector, but you can also control it to be saved somewhere else. Um, that's what this option here is for. So um, for the prices and stocks and sales channels, we will um, discuss these later when we come to the SAWS tables because this subject is too huge to be just discussed like that. So uh, now we had a look through the settings uh, so we can move on to the uh, created entities. The auto-installed contents of entities. If the connector is freshly installed on your system, it will create a lot of new attributes and other entities in your contents of PIM and uh, your MAM. Um, and generally, it is not recommended to delete these uh, attributes or classes right away, especially here in the MAM, the, these four attributes should not be deleted. Um, but uh, all in all, these auto-installed uh, attributes, also here in SAWS connector attributes, um, are only a guideline for you. So, um, we developed a lot of different attribute types for condensive attributes. These are also called uh, CS types very often. And as you can see, uh, next to the normal condensive attributes, there are also our attributes. So. Um, I cannot go into detail with all of them, but you can uh, crop images, um, display sales channel connections, shorten values based on transformation lists, um, and most importantly, use our SAWS tables, which will be handled in the next chapter, um, and many, many more very, very useful things. Um, and it, I cannot stress this enough that these attributes here are just a guideline. You can create them completely freely. Um, so let's uh, take this, these prices here, for example, but you can change the name um, or what you can also do whenever you want, create a new attribute and um, build it yourself. So um, First things first, in my case, for example, I have all these connector attributes. I have these tables, I have things I use for different connectors like Shopware 6, uh, etc. And then I created myself a class. Um, and for example, uh, if your connector is freshly inserted, you will have stuff like these SAWS connector classes, but you can use these attributes just like any other condenser attribute. Um, that's the point I'm trying to make here. And uh, in my case, I just dragged all these attributes into the master class, a class which I've given to every product. So let's head into a product here, for example. Um, and then I said, well, I want all of these attributes in the um, pain SAWS connector and but divide it into different sections. As you can see here, prices have their own, their own, etc. But it is always possible to create your own. So if you want to um, have different price tables, maybe differently filtered, because we um, added options here to filter them uh, for price types, for example, and you want um, more tables in your product editor, that's completely fine and possible. So all you need to do is create, well, I, I'll just show you, create a new attribute, let's call it um, other prices, <laughs> why not? Um, and then head down here to the connector attributes and select external tables. I will create one, yeah, 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 sure. And 
then say yeah uh, that shall be in another section that shall be in other prices as a section for example but still um, as a WS connector why not um, and let's see here then you can select the different tables so I will select the price table just again save it have these new options available down here and say yeah um, here are only the prices for shopware for example so it is filtered for the price type this is entirely possible so um, the connector comes in, included with a lot of attribute types and um, they are pre-installed here but you can change them in any way and just a nice uh, feature if you have it here in condenserve you can add uh, the flag height in a description and this well um, and this will cause the GUI to be a bit different then this section right here this uh, square part will be hidden so the table will be even bigger um, to manage the table and one thing uh, I should mention well I would just clean this up here because I already have enough price attributes in my case um, I should mention that the pre-installed attributes let's take this here for example always come pre-installed with an external key and uh, if you delete one of these attributes you can um, well as you just saw, saw easily do so um, it will be reinstalled because the connector whenever it um, updates itself it checks for all of these installed attributes and if um, an attribute with this external key is not there anymore it will be reinstalled and so if you plan to uh, use your entirely own attributes I would recommend you to just um, say write something like here deprecated in front of the attribute label and just uh, leave them untouched um, as you can see here so uh, that these are just unused but not reinstalled all, all of the time for example um, when I started to talk about this I was checking the external key here and because I left it empty this attribute reinstalled itself down here so um, because well the connector noticed that the external key was missing but these are not the only kind uh, uh, again I cannot explain all of these attributes because well there are even some for the media asset management um, but uh, that's not all also value ranges are pre-installed so let's have a look down here you can access the value list on various positions in Condenserve. You can even um, access them by uh, our navigator down here. And the value ranges that are installed with the connector, they are you are not allowed to delete these, um, or it is very much so not recommended. They um, have a specific external key, for example here, SAWS connector channels, and they shall not be changed because um, in this case the connector uses these value ranges for various implementations and if the external key is changed it doesn't find it anymore um, let's take a more accessible example um, for example the price types or currencies um, if you're using the connector prices you want to be able to set the currencies for example and you can do so by adding them into this value range and this will affect a lot at first yes you can change the currency for a connector price sure uh, we will get to them in the next chapter but also if you're exporting prices or um, configuring a data map then these currencies I can just show you that real quick the currencies will appear in the data map as well so um, these value ranges are a central component let's look right here here for example we can select the currencies and then um, these value ranges will appear here so the value ranges are um, 
a core component um, and that's the reason they should not be deleted but they can be expanded in any way um, for example even the mapping status which um, marks a data map row if it is finished if um, it's still a draft for example and uh, you can extend them whenever you like so um, just add new values in the same value structure and the connector will react to it um, this is one of our uh, core approaches to the connector design um, we often talk about that it has to be dynamic and it has to be expandable in any way so whenever we think of things like currencies or price types we we know that they can be more than just two or five or ten they can be expanded um, so we use these content serve components in the best way possible to make the connector expandable um, so that's why we use the value ranges because well why not use already good components um, that already exist and another thing com comes pre-installed with the connector um, and i'm speaking of active scripts not only does the connector come with um, a lot of active scripts that can be selected here which i talk about also later but it also pre-installs active scripts um, mostly uh, this one here for asynchronous jobs these this active strip communicates with um, message queues jobs um, because the connector can also export via message queues very very complex once again um, not recommended to delete these pre-installed scripts and the connector also comes equipped with housekeeping the pre-installed housekeeping active script is just as you can already see here um, it's here to clean up after you and also after the connector um, it deletes old cache files and also old database entries also um, as always this should not be deleted uh, unless you want to have old unused files uh, laying around well normally the connector cleans uh, up after itself uh, if it leaves something in the cache but you can never be too sure so um, we implemented a housekeeping just like content serve the saws tables if we want to have a look at the saws tables we first have to have a look at the settings again um, so let's head right into there and um, as you can see the sections i previously um, didn't mention are here for the tables so the saws tables are um, at first things first tables for prices stocks sales channels and complex articles um, the tables are a um, direct connection to the database uh, to have uh, very very fast records and um, records that can be changed very quickly so um, if we have a look into a product for example this one here has prices this here is just a very beautifully presented um, window into the database because these prices are not like normal attributes that they can be inherited um, and passed on to children in, well not in the literal sense at least and they are exactly maintained here at a product and um, this here is a pre-filtered database list what i mean by pre-filtered for example these prices here we have here these six prices that this element has this is our window we are looking um, through this nice looking windows at the database in fact but you can also see all prices um, down here, for example. As you can see, there are many, many more, and they are exactly set to a product in this case. So why are they so much different? So um, let's say prices per se. Um, why use them instead of just a list of attributes? Well, I have 20 prices, so I can create 20 attributes, why not? Well, um, we noticed that prices are often more than one and um, so we noticed that creating 20 attributes can be kind of a lot and instead went um, with this faster model so you can um, if we go into the product context again just check the product out and create a new price whenever you like um, and we went with this model because at first 
there are many prices for example so you will create more than one and second they can be easily imported with um, excel lists for example or um, comma separated value lists and uh, third by using these direct database records it is also a lot faster and especially with data like prices and stocks which change so so very often um, because we all know how fast a stock changes in a running shop um, it is very nice to have a very fast list of prices and also um, let's say if you use 20 price attributes where you write well this costs 16 dollars for example um, then you do not have the validity ranges for example um, so we thought of that we, we thought of price lists of price types of um, prices for different sales channels um, and we also thought of uh, validity ranges so uh, valid from valid to because well it is more than normal to have sales for example um, or other promotions of products where they well are reduced in the price a bit so um, to go back to the settings, you can decide which, uh, which SAWS tables you like to use. For example, the prices, stocks, um, they are pretty self-explanatory, uh, sales channels or complex articles. <clears throat> um, if you activate this first checkbox in each section, this means that the connector noticed that you changed something, um, uh, that you want now to use a table and will then install a the pre-installed attributes like from the previous chapter but also the necessary database records so you won't need to think about this um, you can then also have uh, additional options for these tables uh, but i don't want to uh, explode the scale here and uh, just well price and stocks i think they are pretty self-explanatory but to sales channels um sales channels are very much so the representation of your uh your stores your store views for example magento for example uses the um, word store views a lot for this um you you have different shops for example the german shop or and then the austrian shop and these are not different languages, they are just different store views. And the sales channels are um, the, the connections to these store views. The, um, they describe the flow where the data shall go. For example, you have a product with several sales channels. Let's have a look here. Um, this one has the sales channel Europe and Shop by Sixth. This means that it uh, is active here with the status. It is active for um, the European shop, which I um, thought of, and also for the general shopware shop, for example. Um, all of these tables have been expanded over the last years a lot. Um, so there is general inheritance and there is much, much more to say about them. But I'm, I'm trying to stay general here. So the sales channels are very, very useful if you want to control where a product shall be visible. Once again, you can also use 20 attributes, for example, 20 checkbox attributes. It is active in this shop and in this job, shop. But, um, well, we thought that might be faster and also better importable wifis. The complex articles are, well, as the name suggests, already pretty complex. Um, these describe uh, the typical connections between uh, the variants and a variant head. So um, it is more than normal that you have variant products or variants of a product, most notably um, in clothing, for example, with different sizes and colors. But also in this case here, um, the, the normal TV and then the different screen sizes. They are also variants. Um, but that's not all of it. There are also uh, bundle products, you know, and typical packages where um, where single products are well packaged with others. And um, let's have a look at a very, very typical example. So I have some clothing here. 
my beloved Valdi Pinho Poncho. <laughs> um, this one here is the variant head. That's the Poncho, the, the artificial product. But well, you cannot just buy a Poncho, you must buy a Poncho with a color and a size. So um, this here is the real product that can be bought. And to um, simulate this connection, well, how does this product up here know that these down here are its variants? And that's where the complex articles come into play. Um, as you can see, I have a huge list of complex articles. Um, I added all of these child products here into this product as complex articles. This means you do not have to change anything about the product maintenance, um, but you have this very, very important connection and these complex articles are used by every connector that supports variants. Um, for example, Shopware 6 is e even goes that far and exports the variant head and then reloads the other variants to send these variants to Shopware and say, hey, whoosh, and they are the variants of um, this poncho. So they, these are the complex articles. And um, that's the thing about these four standard um, connector tables. Their implementation is everywhere in, the, in every connector. Um, we tried our best to reuse all of these um, whenever we can. So if you maintain complex articles, they, well, can be used by every connector. You can use them for the variants in Magento or in Shopware 6 um, and so on. Same goes for stocks and sales channels. And the thing is, we even implemented, um, well, from a perspective of a developer, we implemented the tables in a way that uh, you can also design tables of your own. Um, that's why the attribute here, let's go into the um, attributes. The attribute is um, external table and then you can select the table plugin. And as you can see, there are already a lot and um, you can uh, program any of your own, um, which is, well, pretty nice if you want to have these fast database tables that can be really um, collected in a fast pace. So uh, now that you've set them all in the uh, settings, I should mention that you can also um, add additional fields or additional columns to the tables. Um, for example, in my case here, I added uh, the column material to the stock just um, as a test. This means if I added a stock entry, not only can I display the material here in the listing, but I can also then edit it right here. And of course, uh, not only are you able, uh, since the newest version, the 1.16, to search uh, the table entries via, um, well, for once the product uh, PDM article ID, um, I mean by that the uh, content serve product ID, but you can also use this little icon right here to search for the, the exact product numbers. Um, which is very useful if you want to see the exact table entries mapped to a product. And another thing uh, when we're talking about search, the table attributes, they have an option which you can use. Well, of course, they are database entries directly to a product. That, and this means that inheritance uh, cannot be applied. So there's only no inheritance detectable, but it can they can be searched. You can activate an SAWS table for the advanced search and then use that. For example, I will head right here into my demo. Then I'll uh, select the attribute because I activated it for the advanced search here, my channels, and search for the channel um, Europe. And as you can see, then it shows the products where the channel Europe is maintained. Um, the channels have a very, uh, even more so specific search logic because um, the channels 
can also have gender inheritance. For example, in my case, I have France, Germany, and Great Britain, and they all inherit from Europe. So um, how does that work? All of the tables use the previously mentioned value ranges. So if we had to the value ranges, ranges right here, the um, channels, well, they obviously use the channels and you can even create channel folders and then place the child channels into these folders because yes, the channels can work with um, these inherited channels. For example, USA has these right here and Europe has these. Um, and there, these two channels up here are pre-installed, but the, these are really just a guideline. You can uh, delete them, change them. Um, they are just there to show you how you could typically design a channel for different websites, for, for example. And the um, channels also, of course, use the channel states. They can also be freely edited. Um, just make sure that you filter them and the prices, use the currencies and the price types. Um, and as you can see, uh, for example, if I add an, a price type right here um, and call it uh, BC for beloved customers, um, then I can head into the price editor and say, hey, for this product, um, this product is really um, has a price for my beloved customers. This this TV right here can, is affordable for only $4.99 um, for my new price type beloved customers. <laughs> Just an example. So as you can see, you can um, expand it wherever you like. And well, you're even inclined to do so. And uh, to get to the last SAWS table, which is a bit special. And the last table are the to-dos. You can see them down here. You can also find them in our navigator. And if you um, configure a to-do attribute like I did here, you can even find um, the to-dos for a product in the product editor itself. But well, let's head into the normal to-dos um, down here. They are also a, an SAWS table and they are also very um, performant with the database, but they are far more than that. As you can see here, these are to-dos created by the connector for a product. So if the connector um, receives an error of any kind, it will create to-do entries for your product. So you can see, oh, whoa, uh, I forgot something. We will um, get into this later in the export configuration. But um, again, uh, I just wanted to show them to you that, for example, in this case here, uh, it got an error in the products job of my Shop V6 connector that the ID was not correct. So there must have been a problem I'm trying to solve that later. <laughs> um, and once a to-do is finished, you can also mark them as done or as open and then filter them as done and export them again here by uh, export via SC job. And the connector will automatically use the same job where the to-do came from and export them again. Well, um, what to use the to-dos for? Again, just like with the um, dynamic approach of the connector, you can use those to-dos for everything you like. You can also, whenever you want, configure a uh, system that creates the to-dos for you. Um, if, for example, a, an image is missing, we will also do that later. And this helps you to find the erroneous products, for example, products that are incomplete because the price is missing or something um, similar to that. And then you can find all those products and uh, work with them uh, until they are really finished. So the to-do system, um, I personally adore it. Uh, I think it is with a lot of potential if used in the right way. Um, so definitely go check that out. The connector suite. 
Okay, and now we can finally leave the settings and the PIM behind us and go into the connector suite. So once you head into the connector suite, it will be opened like this. Um, and first I want to show you the components that are here and what to look at first. First, there's the navigator on the left. The navigator does not only allow you to um, see the stations and the connectors you're using and what stations are configured for them. It also allows you to jump directly into the prices, the license and the OWL cloud services. The OWL cloud services are already explained in a different video. Um, just so you know, these and this is the official cloud um, from our team and it uh, supports several cloud solutions. Definitely go check out the video. Um, the license manager, I am not allowed to show you that because then you would see my license, but um, you can use the, that to activate your license. All you need is an OWL account. So um, just go uh, on owl.saws.de, for example, um, or just uh, head right here, register yourself um, with the license key, and then you can activate it for your content surf system um, so that the exports are not limited to 10 records. And from uh, the navigator, you can also access the trainings because um, about um, every few months or so, we are uh, hosting trainings for free where you can sign up and uh, learn about new things of the connector or also um, old things, ask questions um, and ask about the possibilities of the connector. Um, so we always make a summarized training of these. And as you can see, you can really um, head into every connector component like the tables from before um, just with the navigator. It also gets very handy when you have uh, already configured exports because then, then you can really um, jump into any component of the connector whenever you want. For example, I can uh, use the right click on a station. There you have huge contexts. Uh, every component here in the navigator has um, an even bigger context um, a right click context, then I can say, yeah, uh, show this dynamic station, uh, dynamic JSON station in the list, and it will filter the list to the station. I can also add a new job into the station, open the station um, in its overview, etc. But uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Then let's have a look at the middle. This here is uh, the station list. It is um, a list of all your configured stations with the uh, jobs as tracks. Um, generally speaking, the jobs are um, your exports. They are the uh, they select what to export and uh, can be optimized and run. And we often um, represent them with uh, this train icon right here, um, and generally with trains. And if you have running jobs, like I can start this one for example, then you can see that uh, the line just got um, orange and you could see the progress of the job. Well, this one was pretty fast. And um, so it's pretty good to have an overview over your um, stations and how the status is. If, for example, a job does not work, it is red, which um, can maybe be alarming. And yeah, yeah, you can also filter, of course, for connectors and different systems. It is, let's um, see here, for example, uh, we filter for dynamic JSON. And um, these are the instances. Uh, it is very normal that you have a um, staged system or a test job and a productive system. And then you can also um, maintain the stations, give them a flag for these so that you can filter for them. Um, development is also thought if you um, maybe want to have a station where you just test out some fun exports, 
um, without really wanting to send them anywhere, you um, can have development stations, for example. But um, these are just flags. They are um, really just for this filter. So um, they won't have any effect on your exports, like that they doesn't, don't send anything or something like that. And on the right, you have the log overview. Uh, the, the overview can be um, dynamically changed. For example, I can say I want the, to see the logs of this job, of the generic XML job, and then I can click um, this paper button right here and see the last log and can see the logs of the last runs. But I uh, can also say I want to see the logs of this entire station. Let's maybe see here and start this job. Then I click here and now I can see uh, the entire logs of the station. So for the mini XML job and generic XML job. And the logs are uh, a very, very important component. They um, show you if a job was erroneous, which often means that uh, something really didn't behave as expected. For example, if um, in Shopware a product was declined by Shopware and could not be updated or in an Excel export that the file could not be created. So very critical things. Um, so I recommend you to check out the errors. We, um, over the last years, we drastically improved the user experience behind the log. Um, you can not only filter for errors, in my case, I have none. Let's see here, maybe this one had an error. Um, you can also use these two buttons. Um, I already showed them in the release spotlight um, to jump to the next error. And that's not all of it. Um, if you click on an error, you see the log entries causing this error. So um, here I had missing return values and then I can see here, okay, um, this payload was sent and then this message was received. Um, very, very useful stuff. But uh, due to the uh, GUI rework we had with the last version, the 1.16 and also the 1.15, um, I personally do not use this lock um, window very often anymore. I often collapse it like so, just by clicking here. You can reopen it whenever you want, again by clicking, not by dragging, that's um, not possible, but you can change the size whenever you like. Um, but I uh, actually prefer another view of the logs. Um, this view I call, um, or it is officially called the job center. By clicking on a station, just uh, once with left click, not double click, double click opens the editor, you get um, instantly into the job center. Um, once again, only if you already have an, a configured station. The job center is in the middle of the wizard um, and it is a very, well, at least in my opinion, nice looking overview of your jobs inside the station. Um, it allows you as always to run the jobs, lock them, export them uh, and delete them. But it also gives you a quick overview of which jobs were um, successful or not. We are using these here. These are called badges um, to give you the most important information about a job um, without having to go into the log and um, open 1000 windows. And now I would just um, start a job here like this. And then I can open the log and see the log of the job and also the log overview. So it is uh, essentially the same as the other, but um, I really do like the design. Um, well, especially due to these nice uh, vehicles driving by when pressing play. Yes, <laughs> um, I, I just like them. <laughs> um, then another thing of the suite, um, which is again, not in the suite itself, are the active scripts from the connector. Um, the, you can uh, access them via the navigator, but also as always in the normal content serve GUI, um, which I personally prefer because, well, I do like to separate it um, and not, uh, 
use the mixture, but again, the connector is um, usable in many ways. So um, I just wanted to touch the subject of the active scripts um, real quick. Uh, if you have the connector installed, you will have um, about a list of this size um, in with the connector active scripts. These uh, do not necessarily have um, something to do with your exports. Um, they can be used for, for various reasons. So um, a lot of these active scripts help you to maintain um, things in Condensive. They help you to create channel trees. This is very popular. Um, they create smart documents for your products, if you like, um, with filters, etc. Um, and let's see here. They uh, they apply the sales channel inheritance, and that's a uh, rather more complex feature. It allows you to um, maintain template channels at um, at folder products and then let them inherit down to the real products that you actually like. This is very, very helpful for the channel maintenance, um, which is a necessary step in Shop for 6. And uh, it also deletes your expired prices if you want to. And um, also a very, very uh, often used one is this one right here. It uh, fill complex article tables. It uh, based on your settings. I will show you the script right here. It will maintain all of these variant connections I previously talked about um, for you um, if you set the right uh, bookmarks. So as you can see here, um, this means this saves you in an insane amount of time and. Well, of course, the most popular one is the pretty normal start connector job script. Um, the title says it all. It's a script that starts a connector job for you. Um, you can select the job and then um, it runs in the mode that you prefer. N the normal setting is that it runs in the normal mode. Um, but why? Active scripts. Why isn't that included in the suite? Well, um, that is a because the active scripts are already a pretty good implementation from Condenserve. It and they have logs and um, statuses, and they can send you mails, etc. But the most important thing is that the active scripts are automizable uh, or can be automated. Um, for example, I can say that um, this job right here, the job from the WordPress connector, um, shall be started at uh, every hour because I want to export hourly. Um, so the connector in the best case scenario, um, you will configure your export and if you don't want to um, transfer anything new, you automate all your exports with uh, delta jobs. Uh, this means jobs that only export changes, um, new changes, not everything all the time. Um, you only um, configure all these exports and then in the best case scenario, you never visit the connector suite again because you automate all of your jobs they run automatically everything is changed and updated and deleted automatically um, because you have all these automation at your automations at your disposal if we head into a job by right click edit there is also the delta option i talked about um, here you can um, for example, say that uh, this job will always only export the changes of the last 24 hours and then um, use the active script to, to automate it daily. This means that only the changes that were made are exported. Um, the most uh, popular ways to automate jobs are um, a daily. Many use it daily the, or others use it um, hourly or uh, every two hours. Um, that's just the way um, you prefer the job. And if you really know that your runs will be successful, you can uh, select a job uh, option like um, last successful run or last run. 
Um, but these are there because you do not always want to export the, your entire product tree again. Um, that's way too much data for no reason. Um, so you want to partially export it and only the changes. The export configuration. To explain you the export configuration, we are going to use the dynamic JSON connector. This is just the newest one and do not click away yet if you're using another connector because the basics for every connector are the same. So even if you're using the simple Excel or generic XML connector, these informations will be useful. If, um, for example, you're using the Shopify 6 connector, there is a specific video, but it is never bad to know the basics of every connector. So let's get started. At first, um, you will have a screen like this, but no tracks at all and um, none of these stations. So you are going to want to create a station. You can either do so by clicking this small button right here or by right clicking your connector and uh, clicking this button here to directly create a station for this connector. I will once again collapse the lock because I want the entire size and click this normal button. This button um, and this window here is not only the, um, the connector selection but also the station management. So if I, for example, click my dynamic JSON connector here, I will see that I already have one station. I can also delete this station and um, import backups into this station. So that's the thing. Um, every, uh, every connector and um, every configuration can be backed up. These are not normal contents of backups. These are um, really backups of your configuration, which can be imported in any other contents of system. So I can create a backup of a station right here, upload it into the SAWS cl cloud, and then import it when, wherever I want. Um, all I need is another connection to the OWL cloud. So in our case, we are using the button create new station from template. Or do we want to create everything? Well, um, in your case, you could log in to the OWL cloud. I will do so just now. And now that we are logged in, you can see the OWL cloud templates. These are templates created by us for you to um, give you a good starting point. So. Um, for the dynamic JSON connector, I created a station for the file creation and a station for the OWL data hub. But to, um, to better explain it to you, I think I will create a new, an entire new station. But you are very inclined to use these public templates. Um, we made a lot of these public templates for every connector. So please go check these out. Uh, they can save you a lot of time. And for the other thing, they are the OWL cloud backups. Like I said before, you can then um, create backups of your configurations and upload them into the OWL cloud backups whenever you want. But let's create an entirely new station. Let's call it dynamic JSON tutorial. As a dynamic, as an external key, I um, I always like to use camel case like so. But that's just how I like it um, to keep it S key compatible. <laughs> then let's say I do like for uh, the JSON connectors. I always use a kind of orange. Why not? Let's use a little bit um, darker one and it's a development system. You can add a description that's very useful to um, to tell your colleagues and your co-workers um, how, uh, what a station does. And also now we are in the wizard, uh, which I so often named before. Um, the wizard is the very new GUI, also shown in the new release spotlights, which um, directly leads us through the entire configuration. So from top to bottom, we will follow these steps. Um, there will be a lot more later. And uh, then we, at the end, if we reach the activation step, if I did everything correctly, we will have a, well, normal export to start with. 
and um, what's also nice about the wizard um, are these texts here. Um, these are the help texts which can be toggled via this button down here. And they explain every step along the way. Just every step comes equipped with um, a small description like that. And um, while we're here, I will explain what the station is. Right now, we are creating a station. The stations are um, the stations are uh, the exact uh, component for the target system. For example, you have a um, staging shop and a productive shop, and both of these are target systems with a target URL where the data is sent to, for example. So I, in this case, you would create two stations, one for the staging and one for the productive system. Um, but if you want, for example, if you're using file connectors like the dynamic JSON or the simple Excel connector, um, you often do not want to have about 60 jobs in one station. So you can also create more stations to have some kind of folders. That's never wrong. Um, you can just uh, use it to uh, keep an order in your connector suite. So in our case, we will now proceed. Now about proceeding, you can um, save every step manually, but by clicking next, it is always saved anyway. So I would just click next right now down here. And now I have to choose a transmitter. As you can see, every component is uh, explained with these text, but just in short, the transmitters are um, the different types of data conversions for your target system. For example, as you can see here, you can send the JSON via HTTP to a system, or you can send it directly to the OWL data hub, or um, what we'll do right now, we will create a file, so it is just converted into a file, the file transmitter. Um, let's also call that um, JSON file creation, for example. Now um, we are in the data maps. The data maps um, define how to export. <laughs> um, they are the most complex component in the connector. They have formats and um, a lot of rows and they define how the data looks like, um, how a product which is loaded from content surf is transformed before getting um, written into the JSON file. So um, let's create one right here. Let's call it dynamic JSON tutorial. And move on. So the reader defines what objects to load from ContentServe. Um, throughout this tutorial, I only talked about products and sometimes uh, channels. But uh, the connector can load almost everything from ContentServe. It can load um, directly the media asset management files, the products, the channels, um, even the sales channel reader. This is a bit more complex. Um, or attributes, if you really want to export attributes, an attribute tree to a system, which is often very useful if for example, a system requires you to create all classes and attributes on, on the target system. So, and with this last reader here, it's called read values from different CS data bank records. With this last reader, you can even almost export everything like workflows or languages. So um, I think uh, these readers should keep you covered. So um, let's start with a really normal product export and choose the product reader. This means that product data is read from ContentServe. It is loaded via the get values API. Um, okay, then you can uh, use these filters. Um, if you really want to filter the entire data map to some um, of these workflow states, but um, we personally do not really recommend to use these filters because you can use um, any filters you want in the job editor later. So when you're configuring the job, so um, 
these are just here if you really want to define it for all jobs throughout all jobs that only for example productive products are allowed to be loaded but um, I want to see every object so I would just keep it like that and um, yeah just just a simple content surf basic about these multi selects um, software for content surf and content surf itself designs it in that way that um, if you leave multi selects empty like so choosing no um, workflow state this always means that everything is selected um, especially for those filters another small thing um, selecting filters of course uh, makes the export a bit slower because well it has to filter right so um, yeah I do recommend you to leave this empty if you want to um, export everything do not select everything because it makes it a teeny tiny bit slower okay so let's move on now to the language settings these are very straightforward we want to export languages um, I say English and German and why not French is also nice um, then we can define um, which key the language they have in the export so um, how the target language is called or the store view in my case I say that um, English is called en-us and German is de de, and French is fr fr. And as mentioned in the previous parts of this tutorial, the connector components like um, the currency or the channels are now directly in here too. So we can apply a channel to this language. This is also very useful if you want to be more precise. Let's say you are exporting to. Um, enus dot uh, let's say Florida and California then you can use for example en dash us dash fl or fl for Florida and in the other one dash us dash color California so cf why not <laughs> as you can see then you can uh, use the channels to be more precise let's fill it um, that's also useful if you then want to filter exports for example create a job which only exports to uh, the German shops so with the Germany channel and um, another job which only exports to the American jobs and then filters for Florida and California so this is very dynamic you can change uh, that to your liking so just keep that in mind and then you can also choose the currencies meaning that uh, the price export is filtered to these currencies for example in the um, US exports there's always the dollars and in the others euro same goes for stock you can say I only want to export products which have the stock but by setting um, these settings here this does not mean that anything is filtered right now this does just mean that a language is mapped to a target language and to a channel and to a dollar and, and to um, the currency. The filters themselves, you still have to implement them. Uh, so by setting these, by filling these, nothing is filtered yet, but you can use this later, um, which I won't be able to show you because, well, it would explode the length of the, this video, but um, just keep that in mind. You can have a really precise export. So let's move on with these four languages. So um, the node maps, these are relatively specific to the dynamic JSON connector, but um, the generic XML connector and software six connector have them too. And the simple Excel connector also in a slightly different kind of manner. Um, the node maps are the containers in which the data is filtered into. For example, you can create a node map for uh, categories. Let's use lowercase here and a node map for products, for example. And then in your, um, in your export, you will then have uh, these different kind of maps. I, why not? Let's do it like that. So we will select categories here and products here. Um, 
and these will create the sub mappings. I will just show them to you real quick. Because I have created two node maps now, I have these two sub mappings later in which I can fill the data. But um, to th think about how to format something is the product um, goes into the connector. Let's um, see it like that. Then it goes into the node maps and works itself through these node maps. First, it starts with categories, then heads into the category map here and uses all these rows um, with their according formats. Then it goes back, heads into the product map and goes through all of the product rows. But now you might be thinking, huh, but I do not want a product to also appear in categories and products. And this is where these li two little buttons uh, come into play. Um, let's say I only want to export categories and categories. Well, that makes sense. So we head down here. And uh, this is our very first format plugins. I will uh, get into more details about them later. But um, I only want to export um, folder products into categories. So a, what I mean by a folder product is a product, let's head here, here's the normal TV. And a folder product is something like that, the smart LED TV. So these kind of categories. And these have um, a specific value called is folder set to one in the database. I can also show you like that. Here we have the products and they have is folder active or not by, represented by this checkbox. So I want that only the ones with is folder equals true um, appear in the categories and the ones with is folder equals false shall appear in products because these are the real products, right? So to do so, you can use the conditions. So let's head into the node maps where we can set the condition. Let's see here. We want to skip the product or the object for uh, this node map if um, the unformatted fo value of is folder equals uh, false because false shall not appear into categories. So we use the condition. There are a lot, but we use the unformatted value of an attribute, say is folder. I am always using these autocomplete options here, but you can as always use the attribute select as well. Um, and it shall be skipped. Um, what helps me when configuring conditions is to always um, read the entire sentence. So an object shall be skipped if, and with the condition is folder equals false, so zero. In this case, it shall be skipped. And on the other hand, the products shall skip an object if it has is folder equals one. So once again, skip object, condition for unformatted value, is folder equals one. Just a short thing about the conditions. The conditions are, they work exactly like um, conditions in programming. You can connect them with an or or an and connector. This means ands, and means that every condition has to apply and or means that only one has to apply. Um, in my case, I only have one condition, so it doesn't matter what to choose here. And you can even, um, you can configure as many conditions as you want and also configure sub conditions. So a new group of conditions down here, but we will keep it simple. Then um, we have these, uh, dynamic JSON specific options in the node map settings. Uh, these are these two. And in my case, I want all categories to um, be exported in the file categories um, with, and they shall be re-added. This means every time he goes into the file, it shall be added to it. These are um, JSON specific options. So, um, Let's do that for the products too. I want them to be saved in the file called products. And 
um, they shall be always added. So this file is a container. Then now let's get to the core component. Um, keep one thing in mind that right now I am configuring the data map, one of these huge components in a connector export. And it is completely fine if you don't know everything you want to export right now, you can always head back into the data map um, and edit and change it. And I will also show you how to do that in the most precise manner later. But in my case, um, I already know what to export. So in my case, I want um, a category export with the ID and the name. And why not the sort order, for example. And then I can um, choose the source attribute, which fills this target column. Um, and in my case, the ID is the PDM article ID. So the contents of database ID of the product. And the name is the label. And the sort order, well, it's the sort order. Now to get to the formats. These are the formats, also called the format plugins. And these are a very, very huge list of plugins which allow you to format almost everything. Um, meaning you can um, at first export values directly. So the formatted value, this means the value that is presented in the editor, the nice looking formatted value or the unformatted value, which, which means um, only the thing that is stored in the database. All of these things can vary a bit and that is very content serve specific. But um, generally you can say if you want the, um, the beautiful looking value that just uh, that shall just be entered somewhere, um, you use the formatted value and for the technical value you use the unformatted. Um, and there are a lot of plugins. They allow you to cast data types, to cache values, encrypt them, use array operations like um, reducing entries from, from an array of values, um, encode it to a JSON, etc., etc. I could go on for hours. Um, what I want to say with the format plugins, um, for you, if, um, if you have a thought that a value is received from Condensive and it shall look in any way different in the export at the end, the connector will be able to do so. Um, you can trust me on that one. Um, the format plugins reached a complexity over time that they can almost be considered a programming language of their own. Um, so you can really do almost everything with them. Um, we already touched the conditions and these we were only scratching the surface with that. But for now, we will just use the most used plugin, the formatted value. This plugin is um, by far the most used one, the formatted and unformatted value. Um, so let's add them right here. You probably already noticed that the fields often turn yellow. Um, this means that we have unsaved changes that um, will be stored once we move on or press the save button down here. And uh, you also saw this little um, boyo right here updating. Um, these are uh, the OWL suggestions with um, the assistant. It allows you to, uh, well, it shows you suggestions that the AI thinks suit here. For example, for the sort order, it thinks that C is formatted value is definitely a good call um, because most people probably use C as formatted value in that case. We can also have a look at the suggestion, what he used here. And um, well, as we can see here, these are just the normal value. Okay. Um, but in my case, I won't need the assistant because um, I'm working uh, with the connector 24 seven. So um, let's save this and let's also configure the products real quick. So once again, we have the ID, the name, the sort order. Oh no, the product shall have, for example, the uh, product number where we then choose a specific attribute like the external key, which is our product number. Um, I'm all, 
using all these text attributes, you can of course use any attribute you have in your system. For example, I even have a specific project number attribute um, down here somewhere, but it is not maintained as well as the external key, so I will that use that one instead. And the label and the ID. Just, we are starting out simple, why not? So, um, another thing you might be wondering about, hey, uh, well, I have language dependent attributes and language independent attributes. That's, that is of course considered by the connector um, perfectly. So the label, for example, is a language dependent attribute because the name is most probably different per language. Um, but every attribute you use that is language dependent, um, let's say you have uh, these images or a, the short text, it will then, um, you can even see that in the assistant, if I go down here, it will show me, oh, language dependent values, yes. So the connector will even tell you, oh, I will consider this attribute here as a language dependent one, so um, I will export it language dependently. And uh, we even consider that value ranges and content surf tables, etc., can be language dependent too without having the language dependency option set in content surf. For example, right here, um, this is a content surf attribute. I just opened that via the assistant. And you can set the language dependence option down here. Um, but for example, Many attributes can be language dependent for an export, like value ranges, where you select multiple things, because the values themselves are language dependent, they have a different value, but um, you are selecting the same thing. Uh, I hope you uh, understand what I mean by that. Just, um, you do not even have to uh, consider that that much because the connector does all of that for you. So. That's fine. Um, and now let's move on to the jobs. The jobs, like, um, I don't know, we received a new step, so let's go into that one first. The data map root nodes, they um, define to what nodes a data map is limited. So you can limit an export to a specific um, content surf node. In our case, I say only products that are below demo are allowed to be exported. This means that the entire thing, um, everything that will be exported via this data map is only allowed below this node. This means the chops can only export things below this node and um, also the right click export, a um, special feature from the connector and many more exports only are allowed below these nodes. So the job, as I already told you, these are the nice looking um, train icons that uh, run around in the connector suite and uh, they decide what to export. So you select, well, let's head into the job. You will select the um, origin of export data. So let's say here we have a job that exports the categories. Then let's move on. Oh, we already skipped a lot. Um, I will head back later. Let's add a root node real quick and some actions. Um, well, the job also has a description for colleagues and the job parameters. Well, um, they are too complex to explain right now. Um, you can um, change a job run based on the parameters and use them via format plugins. Um, you must visit our wiki for specifics like that. So um, in our case, we want to export categories here. So I will select the root node demo. Um, the connector was so kind as to um, pre-select my data map right here. Um, thank you very much. But you must select the data map of a job. And then for the actions, I am seeing products and categories. Um, that's the reason because I um, added these two in the node maps before. So let's save this and move to the data map. I can move there via clicking here. 
but I have many more options to move there. I can also use these two new buttons down here to, and this one to open the station overview. Now I see, okay, my uh, newly created job categories is connected to this data map in the station dynamic JSON tutorial. So I add uh, head right here back to the data map. And in the node mappings, you see that I had these two actions selected. Um, and that's nice because then uh, you can select these actions in the um, job as well. So if I head down to the job, I can say, hey, this is my category jobs and it only uses the category action. So only the category node maps. It will not even consider the other node map um, because, well, it sh shouldn't. And as I said before, here are all of these filters. Um, and as you can see, the job can filter in many more ways even. For example, I said before that we only want to have an American export in some cases, then you would select these two store views. Um, so these two target languages. But in my case, I want to export everything. You can check these filters out. There are a lot. Um, one new filter that um, was about recently added, um, about one and a half years ago, <laughs> was the mapping state. So these allow you to filter um, data map rows in your um, job. For example, I say that only approved data map rows shall be exported. If I save that and head back into the data map, this means that only the rows that have this green checkbox right here are allowed to be exported. Um, and you can change the mapping state either with uh, this option here or via the assistance by clicking into a row. You can also click this button and see the mapping states here. But in my case, I want everything to be exported, so it's all approved. You can even add mapping states of your own, but um, once again, not to go too far into detail here. Let's head back to the job. As you just saw, I moved via the station overview. You can also use the bar up here. So um, let's move on. This was the data source. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Let's move on to the transfer. Um, these are the options um, for the server performance. So in my case, I wanted to run with three simultaneous processes and with 100 products per package and three packages per process. This, um, these variables, these three right here, are fine-tunable on how strong your server is. So if your server has a lot of cores and a really strong processor, then you might want to use eight simultaneous processes. And if your server can handle a lot of products at once, you might want to uh, raise that number. So uh, instead of having only 100 per package, you maybe want 1000. But um, for this last one right here, the packages per process, um, you, um, it is recommended to leave that at about three because um, that's just the programming of PHP that it runs the best without um, with um, about three packages per process. So the process uses three and then the process is restarted because the connector is programmed with multiprocessing to um, improve the export speed. In my case, I will leave it at that. If you want to set these two settings for the entire connector, you can do so by heading into the connector settings, either via the normal settings we used before or via a double click into the connector. For example, here, dynamic JSON, double click, and we are jumping right to the options and can go right here and change it for all connectors. So let's get back here. I will go to the station overview, go back into my station right here and jump right where we left off. So I'm fine with the transfer, first, so mo let's move on. The job related tasks are um, once again a, 
a bit as complex as the format settings, not as much, but um, there are just a lot of things you can do after the job has ended. For example, moving the file, uploading it via FTP or uploading even other files via FTP and many more things. So just check these out. Maybe uh, one of them might fit your purposes. But for now, we don't need some of them. These are the um, job specific rights. They can be used as well as for the station to limit a station directly. Um, I talked about that previously in the right section of this video. So you can just limit a job a station directly to a user group or um, deny the access for them. And as the activation goes, um, you can decide whether the job is allowed to write to do's. It is uh, very recommended to only let the automated jobs write to do's because otherwise you get way too many into the to-do list. And um, then, well, the active option is self-explanatory and this last one here is uh, very nice. This means that the job can be used for the right-click export or other context exports like exports from the open search or the deep search. Um, so if you, I set this checkbox, I will be able to see it and the right click export via job option, just so you know. But I won't need that for now. And here you would be able to see the to do's for now, but um, uh, we are even getting a message that is uh, deactivated for this job. And also we would not have any to do's yet. So now we created our first job. So why not run it? We can just press um, play or the detail play. The detail play means that even more log entries are created. Um, that is very, well, the detail mode, um, I'm often asked when to use which mode. For the automations or big exports, I would always recommend the normal mode because it does not create as many log entries because um, they could get uh, out of hand in huge exports. But when exporting a small amount of products or a, a medium amount of products and you really want to see every um, log entry, even the unimportant ones, then use the detail mode. So in my case, I will be using the detail mode because I'm only exporting about 10 to maybe 50 objects. So let's press play. Nice, we had the bus. And oh, it was a bit more than these 200 objects, but still very fast. Um, and let's have a look through the, the log. Um, it loaded the records, then the objects. Um, well, if you had filters configured, they would be less than 643 in my case. Um, and as you can see here, it loaded from uh, this change date. So nothing like the last two hours, like a data method was configured. Then the processes are started. These log entries are um, not visible in the normal mode because um, the processes are not really concerning um, the user very much. And then we can see uh, our first process is loading objects from ContentServe. Um, and these are the um, infamous get values from ContentServe. Um, this means this is the input or the data the connector receives from ContentServe. So um, we were loading um, the PDMATIC ID, the is folder, we loaded the two in the condition and uh, sort order, but all the base attributes like the label are always loaded because well, um, there is little to no export where you don't use some of these. And um, if something is exported in a wrong manner, of course, it can be a um, bad configuration in the connector, but it can in rare cases also be the case that um, it is wrongly received from content surf. So uh, for example, if you load a value and it um, definitely has a really strange format, um, you might want to check out the content self load log entry and see if you at least get the right format from content surf. The This is the formatted value and this is the unformatted value. And 
if that is all right, then you should check your configuration. And if that isn't, uh, is correct, then it might be a bug. Um, so who knows? So let's see here, it is loaded. And then um, this is also a pretty um, useful log entry. This is the KPI or the performance log entry. It shows you which of your formats take up the most time. In my case, um, every format takes such a little time that it can't even find 10 of the laziest plugins. So um, in my case, uh, there is nothing to see here. But if uh, your export grows bigger, you will definitely have some formats that take up way more time than the others. And you might want to check them out if you can simplify them. Um, but I'll get into more detail about that when configuring con more complex formats. And then in the end, we have this result log entry right here. And from it, you can download the results JSON. So the created JSON by the connector, I would just do so and open it up in a JSON viewer. So we have a um, more nice looking JSON. Here it is. Let's format it and have a look at it in the viewer. So just as we configured, we have the cat categories nodes and then every exported object. As you can see, if I head back into the data map, every configured row for the categories is visible here in uh, our export. So every object is added into the categories map, which we prepared here as an extra file, as you remember, and with every row we configured. And these exported objects, if we have a look into the tree, directly correlate with our uh, PIM studio tree. Okay, so that's it for the categories, but there is more to do. We want to configure a product job as well. We already prepared a the small node map. So let's head back into the jobs and create an extra one for the products. This one can also export our tree. <clears throat> but this time I will select the product action with three processes, just as the other ones. And that's it. Here it is. And now we can also press play, let it run and uh, download the JSON as before. But there is also a better trick to do that. First things first, we can refresh the navigator on the left here to see both jobs. And then there's a new method called the job pilot, as you can also see down here. So we are heading into the data map and we want to know if our product export is correct and if everything we configured is visible. So you can open the job pilot. For example, I can click here and then choose the job that I want to test, like the products. Or you can use an extra tab um, by right clicking this here and open uh, the job in the job pilot. So everything's possible. And what the job pilot does, it saves you the time of downloading the JSON every time and changing the root node. Um, it lets you test your export. So as we go right here, I will choose the products job. And I do not want to export the entire demo because as we just noticed, um, they, are, they are more than enough objects. I um, just want to test it with about five. So I, which is the one, two, five, two, because I know that these are the LED TVs here. These are four objects and I only want to test it with these four. The nice thing is that uh, changing this root node here does not change it in the original job. So any settings like selecting other actions or mapping states, does not change the job itself, but you can apply them by using this button down here to apply the settings, but I am content with these four objects. So I will press play. And now I have a job run too, but I have a so-called um, development job run. 
um, which means because I'm developing the export right now. The development top run does not only show you the log entries live, they, um, as you've just seen, I can press play again, they appear really, really quick. Um, it also allows you to show to look at the other development job runs, but it also allows you to directly see the results of your exports. Um, if it is like this here, that you do not have these debug exports, you can filter these by clicking these buttons here. And having no debug log entries means that you have no active connection to the OWL cloud services. This means that if you're using ContentServe in an offline system, that uh, it is a bit less useful to use the job pilot. You can still download the results, so it still has its use, but um, it is very recommended to um, unlock the connection to the OWL cloud services in your firewall, for example. So in my case, I've established the connection and therefore I see these debug log entries. For all users of the old connector, uh, this can be compared to the development editor where the export results are um, listed in a very technical manner. So my five exported objects are listed here in a um, good looking manner. This uh, output looks different per connector. So. Um, and this one right here is represented by an array, um, but in fact, it's uh, a JSON, of course, because we are using the dynamic JSON connector. But um, for you to uh, be able to better use this editor, it is um, presented in this more uh, readable manner. Okay, so um, now that we have this set up, this means that um, we can configure and instantly see our changes. And this is the core workflow you'll have with the SAWS connector. That's why I said that the data map, so this component right here, um, is the one where you spend the most time in because here you can configure all your complex exports and then test them pretty quickly with the job pilot. So the workflow is like this. For example, I want to export an image attribute, 28 for images. Um, and export that in a classic image loop. So I'm using the loop plugin um, and save this first. Then I'm going in here, selecting a loop for media asset management. And I let's say I just want to export the URLs in a simple array. So I directly select the loop value right here. And let's see here, we want to export the URL to this media. And so we select it down here. This is the format plugin tree. It allows you to move very quickly through your consecutive formats. I will go into detail about this later. So now just save that, go back into my job pilot. The settings are all still there and press play again. Let's see here. Now the image is returned with a URL. So nice. I see I just configured a new row with a format and it instantly appeared. And that's the um, very, very good use of the job pilot. Once again, you can open the job pilot into another tab as well. Um, and you can also switch the job. The job pilot is even smarter than that. Um, for example, if you head into a job, like into categories, and then click the job pilot, it is pre-filtered to categories because it noticed that you went there, so you probably want to test that one. Um, the same applies when I move into the data map again. I head right here. And then, uh, for example, I'm in the mapping because I want to configure something here. Then the job pilot shows me all the jobs that are connected to this data map. So also like here in the station overview where the jobs are highlighted that are using my um, data flow right now. And if we move into the job again, then we'll see that the station overview context has now updated itself. And as you can see here, it highlights us the way of our data right now. So because we're looking at the product job, 
this one is highlighted. And next up, I want to configure a few more rows with you in the data map. So we head right back into there. And with more rows with format plugins and I want to explain them along the way. So I will prepare the job pilot again by opening it and setting a smaller root node. The TVs shouldn't be too many. And let's test this right here. Okay, as we can see, our four TVs are exported. Um, you should know that only four TVs are exported. Um, even though I selected a different root node, I selected the TV, the smart LED TV right here. But if you remember, we configured a folder filter um, for the products that uh, this object right here shall not be exported. Um, so that was the configuration from here in this field. So um, let's have a look at the data map. The format plugins um, are the component right here and they are by far the most complex component in the connector um, in an already complex data map. Um, I even added a link for you here um, which leads you to our wiki and explains the format plugins further because a format plugin alone is already quite huge. A format plugin can already have a documentation. It has a help menu with a wiki link and um, every format plugin or most the most ones um, have conditions and placeholders and their settings itself. So let's start with the conditions. You already seen them in the node map before. They can Conditions are like exceptions, so a, uh, you can configure a mechanic um, that only applies in certain cases. So for example, um, skip a data map row if um, the source value already was empty. Um, with the conditions you can do almost everything um, logic-wise. So very the most popular ways to use conditions are either to skip rows if um, a source value was empty or to use um, another attribute as a fallback for example um, if the product name is not maintained then just use the content surf label instead things like that um, or use an alternative formatting this is also very popular for example setting a condition for the attribute type and if it's a um, normal text attribute then just use C as formatted value you know and if it's a selection list or something similar to that then it shall be formatted in a different manner maybe with a loop um, and so let's move on to the placeholders so the placeholders started out as a text that you can um, replace in another text so for example if the text contains this string currency right here then this string shall be able to be replaced by another value. So um, for example, I want the placeholder product ID to be replaced by the attribute product ID. Uh, product number here, for example. So um, if the text contains a string that looks like this, so here, like a placeholder, then it would be replaced with product ID. But the placeholders um, now are mostly used for other logical things. So the original plan for text replacements uh, only started out as the intended use, but now placeholders can be far, far more. For example, um, very popular ways to use them is, well, to, um, to implement a logic, for example, if I say, let's save this right here for a second. If I say, return a placeholder if, and then configure whatever configure whatever condition, for example, now the always true condition that always applies, then I can, for example, well, let's use the placeholder name again. And then um, by selecting this condition, the editor field down here appeared, return of a placeholder. So because we just selected that and, and then I say, yeah, please return this value right here. Um, where it could be useful, for example, because earlier, let's um, even use this feature, why not? 
because earlier in this video, I said that the external key is mostly um, uh, not maintained, but uh, only in some products they, there is the product number maintained. So we'll um, just configure a logic which uses the external key as a fallback, so as a replacement value. And we'll do so, so I will select product number here. Product number, let's see here. Um, I'm using the SAWS autocomplete. Then let's, let's save this and then head into here and configure a condition. And we want a condition which returns the external key if the product number was empty. So I say um, return a placeholder value if, and it always helps me to read the sentences again, and uh, return a placeholder if set condition for an unformatted value. Oh, no, no, why not? Let's say set a condition for a placeholder. To do so, we must simply add something here real quick. We want a condition for a placeholder because then we can use the placeholder directly in the condition. Um, and we say uh, if the product number, the placeholder, if it is empty, then it shall return something else. Let's see here. So we have the product number right here. Then it shall return the external key. And now the thing is, now I would have to add product number here as well, because, well, I want to set a condition for the product number. Um, but the annoying thing would be that if the attribute for the product number now changes, I have to reconfigure this one here too, and this can be overlooked very easily. But we have a shortcut for this, and this is called source. Source means the attribute that came before, um, and not exactly the attribute that came before, more so the value that came before. So you can use the source even in lower configurations, and it will be the value that what was passed to the format plugin. So let's see here. If the product number is empty, then uh, we have return placeholder value and we want to return the external key down here. So now we just configured a fallback mechanism. Whoops, I collapsed that here. And let's save this. And we can directly go test it. Let's see here. Okay, so the product number uh, was even used because I think I maintained some for the TVs. Let's have a look. Um, I added the attribute down here. Yeah, so it now uses the product number and um, if it's empty, it uses the external key. So we can also test it with an object that has no product number maintained. I think I have none in here. So we can use this one to test it. We would just head into our top pilot context where this button here and why not? Let's just edit and now both are selected. Let's see here. So in the case of the newly added TV, which is right here, it uses the external key. Nice. So I, our fallback logic just worked and we can even um, create a log entry if we want. Um, that's this option right here. Um, let's, why not create a notice log entry, which says product number was empty. And something like, if you read this, uh, please fix it. <laughs> so th this is how you pass on work. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's press play again and see if he, if the connector writes the new log entry. Yeah, right here it wrote product number was empty. Yeah, now you might be thinking, why did it write it uh, four times? This must be because we were using four languages. Yes, so it reached the case four times um, and thus created the log entries. Okay, so. 
Now to move on, let's say, uh, let's talk a bit about the format plugins. Um, the format plugins started out as well to format things. For example, if you have the last change and your target system, let's see here, let's send this below the target key last change. And um, your target system expects the, the last change in a different uh, format than, you, uh, than what is delivered by ContentServe. Then for example, we had something like the date format plugin, format date right here. And I would just save that, which allows you to change the uh, date format. For example, our target system has the German format. So um, this would be day dot month dot year, for example. And just like that, we reformatted something. We can also press play and test that. I would just remove our test product again and just use our four TVs from before. And then we'll see right here the last change with the better or the German date format in this case. And um, this is how they started out, but um, they kind of exploded feature wise. So um, not only do we have a lot of format plugins in this version, but also um, you can nearly do anything with them to a point where it's even a kind of a simple programming language is to use the format plugin. Uh, by now they can uh, they can reload values, cal calculate stuff for you, um, create loops where things are uh, where everything in an array of values is iterated on. Um, also merge reference values. Uh, I the list goes on and on. It can even do something very technical like um, creating a conditional format. Um, which is similar to a switch case. I even added a <laughs> programming um, manual in this plugin. So you can at least have a gist of what is happening here. And, uh, and it can even cache values. So yeah, as we see here, um, so it store values intermediately. So you can use them later somewhere else. It um, is insane what can be achieved. And I do not want to go too far into detail here. I really do recommend you to uh, experiment around with these plugins and um, also read our documentation in the wiki because, well, you cannot destroy anything by configuring new rows with format plugins. So um, just test them out, use the top pilot, press play and see what happens. Um, it's never wrong. So for example, we uh, already created an image loop up here for our images. Um, and this is a more special plugin, which I made countless tutorials about for the XML connector. And um, this the loop plugin is the iteration of multiple values and it uh, always has its loop context and then somewhere the single value. So let's configure another loop. This time we are not using uh, MAM references, as you can see here, reference to a mom file, but instead we are using references to other products. Um, for example, the accessories. So products that shall be shown in the cross-selling. And let's say our system needs um, an array uh, with a product number and the product name, for example. And I already have um, an attribute, uh, no, for the accessories. Let's see here. Um, I can also show it to you in a product. The, so this is a standard PIM reference here. Um, to similar products. And we want to export these in an array. So I am configuring a loop head. Um, think of the loop head as something that is always used when you have several values, when um, there can be more than one thing in a reference or a value range, things like that. So 
I would just collapse this right here. And the assistant already shows us that it's a reference to a PIM product and also suggests us other um, nice configurations, but we will configure one ourselves. So um, first we start a loop context and head right here and select a, um, the loop context is PIM references, this time not MAM, Media Asset Management references. Um, but we do not want to export the loop value directly like in the other loop. So we could select single value here. Then we would get an array um, with the single values for whatever we select. But um, again, we want to have the uh, product number and the, uh, the label of the product. So we will then create an array. But first, let's start with the loop context. And um, these cog icons right here um, show that you can get into a consecutive format because formats can be changed, uh, chained in um, an infinite, uh, well, chain of format plugins. But uh, you can also save this like I just did and use the format plugin tree to go into consecutive formats. So instead of opening more and more windows, which can be get confusing pretty quickly, you can um, use the format plugin tree to uh, have an overview. So we'll head into the loop context and say, we want the external key as the product number. I'm not using the fallback logic for now and the label. So here we just selected the attributes that will be available in the loop. And then we want to create an array of values for every entry in the PIM reference. So we're selecting create an array. Then we're going into create an array with the format plugin tree and say uh, we want here the product number in a neat looking camel case and we want the name and here we could normally fill attributes but we do directly take our values from the loop so we're choosing loop value and loop value here and then for the product number we will also head uh, into the consecutive format plugin via the tree and say yeah uh, for the product number we want to export the external key in the normal value C is formatted and for the name the same thing the, ex the label in the normal format so we just configured a loop let's test it out and let's see here so in our product we have accessories then an array of values the first one with product number and 3d tv classes second one full HD TV camera. So as you can see, it looped over every year, um, enter, over every entry in our PIM reference and then um, exported the selected values from us. So that's one way to use the loop plugin, just so you know. Um, you should definitely not only check out the huge list of format plugins in here, but also have a look at the different loop contexts. And so as you can see, you can loop over various things. Um, and for example, also our uh, SAWS tables. That's what I meant before when I said that um, the SAWS tables are integrated everywhere in the connector. And so you can export directly things from our tables. But um, let's also make a, um, a a format to show you how they are chained. So let's say we have a um, meta title. And we have no attribute for this meta title for now. Um, so I would just add PDM article ID as a filler. Um, so it doesn't look too bad to others if my colleagues for example head into this data map and we send a completely fixed value with the send configurable 
parameter value. So I can show this plugin to you. This plugin has, this is a, an SEO text, search engine optimization. Um, and this plugin is a pretty simple one. It just sends the value that you enter in here. You can also use placeholders, of course. Um, in most places where you think that you will be able to use placeholders, um, you probably can use them. So uh, let's export this again. And as we can see here, uh, in the meta title, there is this new text I added. This is an SEO text. And now, for example, I say, well, I have this value right here, but I want to extend it. So I can use things like um, string. Uh, let's see here. Format strings, for example. The, now I have just chosen a consecutive format plugin, which will be chained after this one. So if I save here, you can see that the result format of this plugin will be formatted with this one right here. So let's hint, head into there and say, well, it's a meta title and a meta title is only allowed to be 250 um, characters long. And let's say that it needs a prefix. This prefix is SEO underscore, for example. So let's save this and test it again in our top pilot. Let's see here. Now the meta title has this prefix right here. Well, it's um, shorter than 250 characters, so um, the other setting is not visible now, but um, our prefix is. And now let's say that um, some systems do not like the word SEO. They want it to be written out into search engine optimization, for example, um, in a camel case so let's see here we need to format it again um, so we go into the consecutive plugin once again every um, format can have a consecutive plugin that's a default field for every format plugin and let's see here we need to replace the letters SEO the combination with um, another string and that's where the replace plugins come into play. These are replaced via a transformation list and I do want to touch the subject. So let's see here. Now we head into this new consecutive plugin and need to select a transformation list. So um, string replacements are very, very common in the connector. So we thought of a system which saves you more time than um, to replace the, them every time with a huge configuration. So we um, implemented the transformation lists. This is a collection of lists which can replace components and be reused somewhere else. So I would just create a transformation list and then you will already have a gist of um, what the use of them are. So we say SEO replacement and as an external key, we use this. And we say, yeah, replace all occurrences of SEO. So let's save this. By saving it, we just received this one right here, a new component where we can add our uh, transformations. And we say that the word SEO shall be replaced, replaced by search engine optimize optimization in a neat looking camel case and then it should appear right here nice so our transformation list is configured now by closing this we can select our transformation list so you can already see the use here you can um, use the transformation list um, now in every transformation list plugin. So even in other connectors where you select uh, replace via transformation list, you can use them. You, so let's do this real quick. Ah, oh, here, okay, that's fine. And then test our export. And now the um, letters SEO are replaced by 
search engine optimization. <laughs> um, well, as you can see, this was just an example, but I think you know um, what I'm pointing at. And as you can see here in the navigator, uh, you can always see all of your transformation lists um, here in, a, in an overview. And once again, they can be used across all format plugins and all connectors. And this is also very useful. For example, let's say that um, something changes. Well, you know um, that now the text SEO is not the one you use anymore because it's not uh, search engine optimization, it's now search AI optimization. So then you, I can just change it right here and say, well, this is search AI optimization. And now it will change for every export that uses this transformation list. So this is a really neat central component that um, for the text replacements. And so you only need to configure a replacement once. Another thing, this is just connector specific for the dynamic JSON connector. Um, as I've already said in the release spotlight for the 1.16, um, the dynamic JSON connector is very, very dynamic. You can really control everything there is in um, this connector. So you can control what the JSON looks like and um, why I'm uh, this, why it's this important to me to stress this is because uh, compared to the generic JSON connector, um, where the structure is more fixed with the um, language layer, etc. Uh, the dynamic JSON connector expects you to build the structure because, for example, um, the language dependent exports, normally in the JSON connector, the languages just appear in the export. So if I open the job pilot, set my nice root node again and export it, you do not see any language layer. There's just the key and then the value. But um, normally you do have more than one language in your export, so you need to um, think of the language dependency, which um, in the other connector is thought of automatically, but in this one we need to configure it. And you can do so, for example, the word, uh, the target key name shall be translated. So we will create a lower target key for example, I can write name and then lower key and save this. By using pipe, it will create a new um, array entry below. I will just show you how that looks like. And then we can see that name and then lower key is used. But well, that still doesn't help. We want to have the translated name. So, um, you might say, okay, sure. Um, then we just say it's English. Here we go. But the problem with this is that we have English in every language and where's German or French, for example. And that's where a pre-designed placeholder comes into play. This placeholder can be used in any connector, but it is especially important in the dynamic JSON. Um, and this is called store view. Um, this is a pre-designed um, placeholder which inserts the key of your store view. Just to show you, um, this target language key right here will be then inserted per language loop. So just so you know, the connector for every language, he, uh, it the connector goes into the um, data map and works itself through all of these rows. So by adding store view, um, it replaces the placeholder store view every time with the current store view. So let's just save this and open the job pilot. And as we can see here, now um, it creates one for every store view. Well, in this case, the TV has the same name for every language, so um, that's a bad example. But, well, let's configure the description real quick. So let's lose, use the description. 
and this is also called description with the normal CS formatted value. Let's press play save right here. But we want it to be translated, so we are adding the store view placeholder. Um, there are even more pre-filled store uh, pre-filled placeholders. You can find them in the wiki again um, via this link, if I remember correctly. So let's see here. Maybe we will get the translated description. So the description is down here. Yeah, here it is. So as you can see, the text varies from language to language. Um, I even forgot to maintain some description here in French. Um, but as you can see, um, it is now translated. And that's how you um, export language dependent values in the dynamic JSON connector. But that varies from connector to connector. For example, in um, well, as I said, in the generic JSON connector, it handles it, handles it itself. And um, the shop connectors work differently by far. But the generic XML connector works the same. So you must also add um, the store view placeholder there in a slightly different syntax, but um, all in all um, there. So I think that I, I hope I gave you a nice overview of um, what you can do with the data map um, and how to expand it. So um, as we started out with the wizard, it might be time to now finish it. So we went into the root nodes and then into the jobs. This is our job center, if you remember. And then uh, we forgot to have a look at the rights. This is just um, a simple write management um, that uh, a station can be limited to a specific user group or user, or it can be uh, forbidden for specific users or user groups. And the same settings are there for a job. As you can see that uh, this one has a right step as well. And you can um, configure this specifically for a job. But remember, if you do want to uh, use this, do not forget to um, check out the role of these users because um, if we head right here and say the uh, here, this checkbox means that these specific settings are ignored. Um, so if you want users to be affected by them, you need to remove this checkbox, of course. Um, but I will just leave it like that. So let's move back into the wizard. We were at the right step. And then the last step in the station is whether to set the station active or not. Um, and as you can see here, and with the description text, um, the, the active state of a station just decides whether jobs of the station can be started. This can be very useful if, for example, you, make a, you are making a job migration and say, yes, we are migrating to a new content surf. So we are um, deactivating um, or disabling the productive exports and only the test exports are still allowed to run, things like that then you just need to deactivate the current station. And in the end, the wizard has a special button, the finish button down here. And with it, we will just see the station overview and continue wherever we want. Most uh, probably in the data map, because as you know, <laughs> um, this is the biggest one. And um, the very last thing um, I want to touch are the to do's, I've already talked about them, and um, what's the use of them. So as I said before, um, we configured previously that um, if the product number is empty, it shall instead use the external key right here, if you remember. Um, so in this case, I say that's an error in the product maintenance. Well, um, a product shouldn't have um, no product number. So I want not only uh, the log entry to be an error instead of a notice, but I also do want to create a to do entry. So I will set this checkbox in the condition. 
And if I now export some objects, um, why not? Let's export the entire demo, for example. Oh no, that could be a bit too much. Let's let's tune it down a little. Let's say the HD LED TVs. They should be enough. So I will press play, and as you can see, it created a lot of errors. Product number was empty. Product number was empty, etc. But it does not it did not only create this error. It also um, created a to-do entry. So if I head down here into the to-dos or into the to-dos uh, per job, which you can see by heading into the job right here, then you can see that it created four to-do entries because it only creates one to-do entry per product with the same error. So even if product number was empty is created 5,000 times for this HLT TV here, um, then it is only kept once. So what does the to-dos now say about this product? They say that uh, the product number is missing, obviously, and you can head into the to-do management here and have a look at this product and directly maintain it if you want. So in my case, I now know, oh, the product number was empty. I would just head into um, the product maintenance down here. Oh yeah, here it is. Whoopsie. Um, I would just add one. This is the HLT um, 65 and commit my changes. And then I say, hmm, yeah, well, the to-do is done. It should be working now. And I will just check it and it's gone. As you can see here then, it is not visible anymore because I am only showing open to-dos, to-dos that are not done yet. And as you can see here, oh, there were others too. Um, this to-do right here is now done. And the thing is, um, this can take some time. I would just clear the old to-dos. Um, these are not important right now. Um, and let's say I will fix some more products. Oh, this one didn't have one too. Okay, so I will just head right here. Say, hey, this is the HLT-60. Yeah, this to do is done. I would just check it and it's gone. And I want them to export again. Now I could head into the job and select it and export it, but we thought of a more convenient way. So I would just filter the done to do's, mark them all and say, hey, please export them again here. Then it will, will already say, hey, okay, I know you want to export them again in the same job. And I would just say, okay. And uh, the connector is here smart enough to know that uh, where the to-do came from, from which job. So it will automatically suggest the job where um, it shall be exported again. So I would just pr press play right here. And the job now finished without errors. And just like that, the connector noticed that your to-do is done because it was not created anew. Um, I didn't receive the error product number was missing again. And just like that, the to-do is gone. And I also downloaded the JSON while I'm at it. <laughs> um, the same thing does not work if I didn't fix the error. So if I export the ones where I didn't fix the product maintenance right now, it will just stay in the to-dos because, well, the errors appeared again. And if I refresh, nothing changed except the change date maybe. Um, and I know, whoa, I still have something to do. Um, so the to-dos, as you can see, can be used in a lot of nice ways to, um, keep, to keep track of your product maintenance and if it is correct. Because, well, you do not want to have products in a shop which are, have no product number or which have um, no images, for example. Also, many, many um, customers do not like to have products in the, the shop that are out of stock, which um, cannot be bought anymore. So this is a pretty nice way to check if your maintenance is correct. But as you um, just something which I can tell from the experience, um, it can easily happen that uh, the to do's are 
um, filled way too much that you have 100,000 to do's entries in your list. And this number is way too high. Um, nobody wants to fix 100,000 errors in the product maintenance at a time. So I definitely do recommend you to check out an option in the job. I would just head into the job by a right click edit right here. Um, and this option is job can write to do's. And I would only recommend you to um, let the jobs that are running automatically in the background uh, create to do's. So definitely uh, remove this checkbox for most of your jobs and only use it for the automatic ones. Then the to do's that are created um, shall not be as high. So um, then the number shouldn't be this frustrating, but it is a nice trick. And with um, the SAWS conditions, you can create to-dos whenever you like, because it's, well, it just depends on your condition. So you can, um, just like I created the error message here, you can create any error message wherever you want if something isn't right. Um, so <laughs> as you might have noticed, I really do like this feature. Last tips. Phew, if you made it here, congratulations. I hope you now have a gist of the functionality of the SAWS connector. But I have somewhat bad news for you. Your journey is far from over. I barely scratched the surface of everything which the connector is capable of and was not able to go into all the specifics. On top of that, the connectors are actively developed on, meaning that with every future update, the possibilities increase. Fear not, help is on the horizon. If you want to stay informed, follow these three steps. First, head to our wiki on sawsconnector.saws.de and subscribe to our newsletter. While you are here, you can bookmark the wiki for later use. We only set out handwritten newsletters about once per month, so you do not have to worry about spam. Secondly, visit our OWL cloud on owl.saws.de and check out the schedule for our hosted trainings. You can also watch older trainings from the past. And thirdly, if you are unsure whether your goal can be accomplished with the connector, you can contact us via mail on the address sawsconnector at saws.de and our team will have a look at your use case. I see you in the next one and thank you for watching.